Good morning. I want to invite you to take your Bibles uh, and open them to uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, is where I'm going to begin with you this morning. So grateful to see all of you. I want to reiterate again what Pastor Kim said. Don't forget to be here next Sunday. Um, it's going to be an incredible Sunday together, and uh, we're leveraging that theme around the Super Bowl to join the team. Everybody shout, join the team. Yeah. And uh, it'll be fun to see what jerseys you all decide to wear. I promise we will behave ourselves. Now, uh, we're in this series uh, called Making Your Life Count, and today I, I want to talk about stewardship. I want to talk about uh, money. I want to talk about what the Bible uh, frequently uh, speaks about almost more than any other single subject. And so this morning is going to be uh, just an incredibly, an incredibly fun Sunday. Thank you. Okay. Now, I want to begin in Luke chapter 16. This is a very important topic, um, and it's sometimes, you know, pastors don't like to talk about this, or we get awkward around this, and, and I just want you to know I'm not awkward about this at all. I, th I think we should have this conversation more often than we do, and uh, so today I'm going to just be completely honest and open and transparent, and what we really want to know is what God says about our money. And I can tell you as a pastor, like oftentimes a lot of the prayer requests that come into, uh, that you put online or you fill out and that we're praying for for you, they're related to money in some way, shape, or form. Money is a massive part of our lives, and we see them in the prayer requests. Uh, sometimes the prayer request is about relationships, but then the relationship is in trouble because we have a money issue, or maybe you need to be employed, or you're in trouble and you need help, and we also know that the number one issue of divorce that results in divorce in America is related to what? Money. 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 So I want you to, I, I am convinced today that you want to know what God says about your money. You're not interested in what John says about your money. You are interested in what God says about your money. So I want to talk with you a little bit about uh, what our culture thinks about money, and then we're going to transition quickly to the Scripture. But to start with, I want to begin in Luke chapter 16, where Jesus is teaching, and he says this in Luke chapter 16, maybe starting in verse 9. I'll put the words up on the screen, but I want to encourage you to have your Bibles open or your app open and follow along with me. Luke chapter 16, verse 9. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. Here's this word mammon. Say this word mammon. Uh, we're gonna, I want to just talk about that word for just a little bit in a second. That when you fail, that's a euphemism saying when you die, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Verse 10, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore... If you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Okay, let's keep going. And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. Say this aloud with me. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now this word mammon, let me talk about this word mammon. In your translations, it might say money. Uh, in the original Greek language, the, the term was actually mammonas, mammonas. And they, don't, they didn't have an English word. Some of your words say money or wealth. But technically speaking, this word has its origins in Babylon. In Babylon, there was a god, and the name of that god was Mammon. Mammon represented money and everything that money can buy. So in the New King James Version, which is the one I have up on the screen for you today, they actually transliterated the word mamosas into mammon. 
And it's capitalized, actually, which actually means it's, it's the name of a person, an identity. In ancient Babylon, it was the name of a god. In fact, Babylon originates this name. The Assyrians then take that and develop a full god of worship around Mammon, and it was their number one god that they worshipped. Interestingly enough, when you look at Babylon and you think about Babylon, the word Babylon, when you translate it, means the place of confusion. So I wrote this in, in my notes. Worshiping money as your God comes from a place that causes real confusion in your life. You should write that down. Worshiping money, this is what Jesus is getting at. Worshiping money as your God comes from a place that causes real confusion in your life. And Jesus introduces this principle by talking about the fact that uh, the way that you use your money makes a difference. And there's a lot of confusion about this in your life and in my life and in our culture. Now, for just a moment, um, I want to talk about not your money or my money, but I want to talk about somebody else's money. Say, phew. Because I think there's a lot of reasons why there's confusion about this. And I, I just for a moment, just uh, humor me for a moment. We're going to talk about our federal government. Our federal government earns, takes in $4 trillion. They spend $6.8 trillion. They're in debt, $28.4 trillion. And they put on a credit card, $2.77 trillion. Now, so what I did is I just took that math and I just thought to myself, what if our national government was a person and I were to introduce them to you today? Here's what it would look like. You'd be earning 80000 You'd be spending 136000 Now, let's just kind of stop there for a second. If I were to introduce this person to you, and I would kind of give you their financial snapshot, and I would say to you, uh, this is my friend, the United States of America, and they make $80,000, and they spend $136,000. If I just stopped right there, can we just all agree that something's wrong? Okay, good. That's wonderful. Uh, this person's in debt, 569000 and every year this person charges $56,000 on a credit card that they have no intention of paying. And you wonder why you're confused about money. There's a problem. Now, this isn't a political, this is, this is nothing to do with politics, both parties, all six parties. All participate in this equally. Say amen. amen. It's not a political issue. I'm just sort of pointing out as to why some of the confusion exists in our culture about money. So I want to just quickly talk about three areas of confusion. I'm going to run through this quickly because I, I want to get to uh, the solution to this. So three things that we are often confused about money is. Number one, write this down. Money will make me secure. Money will make me secure. This leads to confusion about your future. Our culture teaches you this all the time. In every facet of our culture, you are told that money is going to make you secure. But it is just not the truth. Let me give a couple verses. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 11 says this. The rich think of their wealth as a strong defense. They imagine it to be a high wall of safety. In other words, if your primary trust is in wealth, if wealth is your number one God, you are imagining that you have an impenetrable defense. When in fact, that is not the truth. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 28. Trust in your money and down you go. 
but the godly flourish like leaves in the spring. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Don't love money. Now let me just be clear about this. The Bible does not say that there's anything wrong with money. It doesn't say that you shouldn't have lots of money. Uh, the Bible simply says that the love of money, the reprioritization of money over God is what gets you in trouble. It's when you make money or mammon your number one goal, the thing that you worship and you prioritize God underneath that. That's the love of money. Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we, this is so good. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my what? Helper. So I will have no what? Fear. What can mere people do to me? This is so good. Isn't that such an encouraging verse? But our culture will constantly try and convince you that money will make you secure. Here's another confusing thing that often happens with our money. Number two, money will make me significant. Wow, isn't this true? Like we buy into this idea that the better, uh, if, I, if I have a house but it's not good enough, I need a better house, I need a better car, I need a better wife, I need, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> better, bigger is more significant and people are going to think about me differently, and they're going to respect me more, depending on what I wear and what I drive and what job I have and how much money I make. And that's just sort of the nature of our culture here in the West. And this leads to confusion about your identity. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Look at this verse with me. Uh, then Jesus said, beware, guard yourselves against every kind of greed. That's what that is. That's what that is. When you think that your identity is, is better, stronger, more popular, more respected by other people because you have money, that's a form of greed. That's what that is. Beware. Guard yourselves against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Hey, some of you just need to hear this today. Because you're comparing yourself with your neighbor or your friend across town or, or whatever, and, and you think that they're more significant than you because they're more significant than you are because they have more. And I, I have great news. I have good news for you. Your significance is not measured by how much you own. Man, I, if, I were, if I were in the congregation right now, I would just be up standing saying, yes, thank you, Jesus. We have this saying at Grace Church that we often say, uh, maybe say this along with me. I'm not what I have. I'm not what I do. I'm not what other people think about me. I am loved by God, and no one can take that away from me, so I don't have to hurry, and I don't have to worry. There's a lot of confusion that money brings you significance. Here's the third thing. Money will make me satisfied. Money will make me satisfied. And this, of course, leads to confusion about what brings contentment in your life. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10 says this. I know I'm moving through this quickly, but I'm just trying to set the stage for uh, some very, very practical talk about our money. Uh, Those who love money will never have enough. I know I've read this verse multiple times over the course of my, my life, and I've often said to God, well, why don't you test me and see? But it's just a true fact. It's just a true fact. Uh, those who, who love money will never have enough. If, if money is your number one God, you're never going to have enough of it. You would think, you know, maybe probably some of the most happiest people in the world are the wealthiest. Not true. Not true. Again, Lord, try me, but not true. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. Romans chapter 4, verses 7 and 8 gives us a wonderful solution to this. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven. You want to know what the secret sauce is to being happy, to being fulfilled, to being blessed, to having a relationship with God that nothing else matters and nothing else uh, competes for the number one spot. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven. 
whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. Yes, isn't that so great? But our culture and everything around us oftentimes just said, well, there's more, more money, you're just, you're, you're, you'll be more satisfied. Now, that was just the appetizer. And now I want, I want to read a passage of Scripture for you um, from the book of Malachi. So kind of go back in your Bibles a little bit to uh, Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. And I want to talk to you about, I want to help you this morning. I want to help you give some tools, some very specific practical tools. Uh, I'll maybe call them guardrails um, for your life when it comes to money. And I'm, I'm assuming that you want to be blessed by God. The scripture teaches us that God's blessing is so that he will get the glory and that other people will be blessed through us. You'll see that here actually at the end of this passage in Malachi. So I'm assuming that you want to know what God, God says about your money. I'm assuming that you want to be blessed by God. I'm assuming that you want to experience the full blessing of God in your life. And in that respect, I want to walk through this passage with you in Malachi. Malachi chapter 3, starting in verse 6. Again, I'll put the words up on the screen for you, but I really want to encourage you to, to read them uh, if you've got a Bible in front of you. I am the Lord, and I do not change. There's a whole sermon right there. God does not change. Our practices might change. Our circumstances might change. Our attitude might change. Uh, but God, God does not change. The context of this passage, by the way, is that the nation of Israel constantly was walking away from God, turning away from God, and God was constantly calling them back and calling them back. I am the Lord, and I do not change. And that is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. In other words, you're not destroyed because of my loyal love for you. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now, return to me, and I will return to you. Let me just stop right there. I know this sermon is about money, but I'm just so incredibly aware that there's somebody in the room here or listening online or over in the sanctuary and you might have came in, come into church today or you might be watching online and at some point in your life, be it recently or a long time ago, you walked away from God. There might have been multiple reasons for doing that. You might have thought you made one mistake too many. God doesn't love you anymore. You're not good enough anymore. Maybe you went through a terrible situation or circumstance in your life and God didn't show up the way that you wanted him to show up and, and you've, you've, you've turned away. And I, I don't necessarily mean by that that you've completely abandoned everything. The fact is you're listening to me right now or you're dialed in online and here's, here's I just want you to hear this, God is calling you back. <laughs> God is calling you back. He's, he's asking you to come back, right? Re now return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven. But you ask, how can we return when we have never gone away? Next verse. Shall people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, well, how do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. You are under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. Next verse. Bring back, I added this word, I'll explain that in a second. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you and I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it and put me to the test. Next verse. Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and diseases. Your grapes will not fall from the wine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heavens. Then all nations will call you blessed, for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord. Okay, I want to talk to you about three 
principles that I get from these verses. I want to begin by reminding you, though, that God's blessing is for his glory. Look at how the end of this passage reads. Then all the nations will be blessed. The fact of the matter is, is that God wants to bless you so that other people, when they look at your life, they'll see the glory of God. They'll see the presence of God. They'll see the provision of God. God's blessing in your life is for the purpose of bringing him glory and meeting other people's needs. And if you want to experience, and my assumption this morning is that you want to experience the full blessing of God, then there are some very basic, obedient kinds of principles that you need to lean into. And the first one that we get from this passage, write this down, is this. Um, Return the first 10%. Return the first 10%. The Bible teaches this all throughout Scripture. Uh, You can see it in this Malachi passage. This was an agrarian society, so literally they got paid maybe once or twice a year when the harvest came in, and they would set aside the first tenth. If we were to read this passage and apply it to ourselves, we would say, uh, when you get paid, bring the first ten percent to the place of worship where you serve and worship that's your storehouse let me just be clear about that that's what the passage teaches for us today that you're to bring the first tenth of your income into the storehouse let's just let me just kind of cherry pick two other passages just to make this point again deuteronomy chapter 14 verses 20 2 and 23. You must set aside a tithe of your crops. How much is a tithe, by the way? This is not a trick question. How much is a tithe? A tenth. How do you figure out a tenth of your income? You just move the decimal point. This is basic fourth grade math. You just move it over one. So if you make, if you bring in hundred dollars, you move the decimal one, how much are you going to give? Ten. If you make a thousand dollars, you move the decimal one more, whatever, how much do you give? If you make a million dollars, I can't do that math because I don't make a million dollars. You move the decimal over, how much are you giving? A uh, hundred thousand. Okay, you get the point, right? It's, it's, uh, there's no squishiness to this number. It's a percentage. And aren't, I'm grateful God gave us a percentage and not a number. Say thank you, Jesus. Okay. You're to bring a one-tenth of all the crops you harvest each year. Bring the tithe that's designated to the place of worship, the place the Lord your God chooses for his name to be honored and eat it there and in his presence. This applies to your tithes of grain, your new wine, your olive oil, and the firstborn males of your flocks and herds. Uh, Doing this will teach you always to fear the Lord your God. So this is a principle of the first, the first tenth. Here's another one in the New Testament. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. On the first day of each week, you should each put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all. So this is the Apostle Paul, right? So this is just, this is just a principle that you're to give the first tenth. The first tenth belongs to God. So when you get paid, here's the principle. The principle is that the first tenth goes to the storehouse. So if you get paid twice a month, when you get paid, on the day you get paid, you say to me, well, John, how do I know if that's true? Well, just look at your checkbook. Or if you're over 50, look at your checkbook. If you're under 50, look at your bank account. What's the first transaction on the day that you get paid? What is that? That'll tell you where that money is going to. Now, God's not a legalistic person. Um, My wife and I have been practicing this principle for our entire marriage. And technically, we give once a month, but I get paid twice a month. But when we started out in this, when we, the first, whenever we got paid, the very day that transaction, the very first transaction, went to the church. It went to the place of worship where we were. That's just the way we rolled. You, wanna, you, you say, well, John, I don't know. Well, just look. Just look. Look at your checkbook. Look at your online account. <laughs> if you get paid on the 15th, what's the first bill that it goes to? Visa? Guy named Visa? A guy named MasterCard? A mortgage named Wells Fargo? Starbucks? Sorry, I just had to throw that in. (laughs) 
if you want to experience the full blessing of God, the full measure of God's blessing, then you've got to bring this tenth to Him. Now, there's a word in this passage this time around. I've been teaching this principle for a really long time, and there was something that jumped out at me this, this time, this week, as I meditated on it. it. It's the word return. It's the word return. And it caused me to think about this a little bit more. And I've, I've often said that a lot of people in church don't tithe. And I'm going to correct myself now. So this is going to go on the record. Everybody tithes. Everybody tithes. The passage teaches that God owns the first 10%. The question is not, do you tithe? The question is, who's getting the tithe? It comes in and God already owns it. It's not yours. You're just directing it, returning it to the storehouse. So it's getting tithed somewhere. It's either getting tithed to your church or it's getting tithed to Visa or it's getting tithed to MasterCard or it's getting tithed to Starbucks. Everyone tithes. Everyone in this room is tithing. The, the, the question is not do you tithe. The question is where does God's tithe go in your life? And this passage and many other passages teach that that first 10% is already God's. And so he says, return it. Which begs the question, because if I'm not returning it, then I'm stealing it. Because it's not mine to begin with. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Everyone ties. The Bible teaches us that the first tenth belongs to God. So the question is not, do you tithe? The question is, where does your tithe go? To whom does your first ten percent go? So some of us need to make some adjustments this afternoon to return the 10%. We've automated, we've automated our generosity. We've automated our, I'm not going to say generosity, we've automated our obedience. I, I often, people often talk about giving 10% as being generous and, and, and wonderful, that's great. But actually giving 10% is just being obedient. Early on in my ministry here, uh, there was an individual in our church family who um, retired and, and uh, he, he tithed off of his retirement check. And, and it, was a, it, was a, it was a rather significant sum of money. And I remember thinking to myself, man, that's a lot. That's just so generous. And so I, I said to him, I said, that was such an incredible gift of generosity and he looked right at me. He didn't even skip a beat. He looked right at me and said, that wasn't generous, John. That was just obedience. That's just obedience. It's not mine. It never belonged to me. It was just passing through. If you want to experience the full blessing of God, then set aside the first tenth. Second principle that we see in Scripture is, is this. Manage the rest of your income. Manage the rest of your income. Proverbs 21 verse 5. Proverbs 21 verse 5 says this, good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to what? Poverty. It's so sad to me that so many of you um, never had a model of what it looked like to have be on a budget. You didn't have people around you that cared enough about you to show you uh, how to manage your money. 
And I, and I want to just say to you, like, we're here to help you. Uh, we are here to help you manage the other 90% like God wants you to manage it. You need tools. You need to get on a budget. And there are people sitting in this room. There's a whole host of people in the sanctuary uh, that have lived life in a disciplined, managed way, and God's blessing has been on their life because of it. And all you need to do, if you're listening to my voice right now and you don't even know how to get started, or if you're one, if, if financial conversations in your household, be it in your marriage, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your relationship, all that just brings stress, then you need help. You need some tools to help you tell your money what to do instead of the other way around. Are you hearing me, family? Every dollar on paper, on purpose, before the month begins. Some of you have way more month than you have money. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So you need to get on a budget. You need tools to help you to make a plan instead of reacting. Here's what this will do to your life. And I don't have time to talk about all the benefits of of tithing and stewardship in your life. But let me just mention this one because this is so true. It's been true in my life and it's been true in other people's lives that I've had the privilege of walking through this journey with. If you will steward the other 90%, there will be less drama in your life. Let me just give you one illustration of that. You get in the car, you go to work, you come out to go home, and you got a flat tire. And you think things like, man, the devil's working overtime. And you don't have money to replace the tire, so you're trying to figure out, well, do I just blow it up? How do I get through this? Blah, 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 blah. And, and it's because, you know what? You, you didn't listen to your grandma who said to you, you better save up for a rainy day. Just drama. That's all that is, is just drama. You know what happens? If you have a car budget line in your budget and your car goes out or you need to take it for repair, you just pay to get it repaired. No drama. Ooh, I must be touching something this morning. Manage the rest of your income. Number three, number three, pursue true riches. Let me go back to this Luke chapter 16 passage just real quick and just remind us, Luke chapter 16, this is just verse 11 in the original uh, text that we read this morning. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, then who will trust you with true riches? In, in other words, um, Jesus is saying, hey, there's some things that you can't buy. In, in fact, we, we know this, don't we? The most important things in life, you actually can't buy. You, you can't buy peace. And yet, we just so desperately need it, don't we? You can't, you can't go down to the grocery store and, and pick up a 12-pack of hope. And yet, don't we so desperately need that in our lives? And Jesus is saying, if, if you would just learn to manage your money, prioritize me in the number one spot, and then learn to manage the other 90% to meet other people's needs and to bring me glory, then I'm going to be able to entrust you with things that are far more valuable, far more important, of far more worth than anything money will ever buy you. But if you want that blessing... Ooh, don't miss this. If you want that blessing, then you have to put me in the number one spot. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, you are the creator of all things. You sustain all things by the power of your words. What came into being came into being because you spoke it into being. 
The very breath in our lungs, the very air in our lungs is a gift from you. The clothes on our, on our back, the shelter over our heads, any semblance of security and provision, it all, it all comes from you. And God, we admit this morning that left to ourselves, we just default into thinking that it's ours. And right now in this moment, Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm asking for your abundant overflow a clear call from you to each and every individual listening to my voice right now, God. Holy Spirit, would you speak to each individual and would you speak these words of invitation, these words of love, these words of deep desire that you have for them to experience the full blessing that you have planned for each and every one of us. God, you're inviting us this morning to bring back, to return the first. To steward the other 90 in order that you might entrust us with the things that really matter, the eternal things, the things that will last far beyond our grave, the the legacy of hope and faith and trust and love, the, the, the legacy of investing in other people and meeting needs, We want our life to count so desperately. We want our life to count. We want to get to the end of our life and we want somebody to stand up on a platform and say, man, their life counted. And here's why. We want to hear them say these words that they learned early on or late on or from this day forward. actually give you, God, what's already yours, and then to use the rest of it to meet other people's needs and to bring you glory. God, if there's somebody listening to my voice right now that has walked away from you, and today uh, they're hearing your voice again, uh, inviting them to come back, come back into the place of, of, of fellowship, come back into the place of um, relationship and forgiveness. Oh God, I pray that you would, you would bring them back by your grace and by your mercy. And God, we look forward to, um, to walking in obedience. We can only imagine what might happen in our church if we all put God in the first spot, the kinds of needs we'd be able to make, the expansion of the gospel that would be, we would be able to participate in. We think of the early church and what an impact they had and so many practical ways and we know God that you want to do it again and so we're asking you to do that you might have a revival right here at Grace Church because we've put you first in our finances so Holy Spirit would you encourage would you inspire would you bring bring faith and hope uh, into this conversations that are the conversations you're having with each individual right now there's fear about this there's insecurity about this there's uh, a, a sense of anxiety about this 
And I pray against all of that, Holy Spirit, and we, I pray that your, your voice would be heard and that the blessing would flow from obedience. In Jesus' name, I pray. And all of God's people said, amen.